gosh, hello. <laughs> we didn't hear what she said. <laughs> we didn't, we missed out, we missed out. I said you're a fantastic charity. Ah, oh, well, we can't argue with that, can we? <laughs> it's really great to see so many of you here tonight, so thank you all for coming. Um, and hopefully we'll find out during the course of the next hour what your particular interest is in mental health, mental well-being, suicide. And please feel free to share any personal stories or experiences you may want to, but that's not compulsory, okay? So when I say please talk to us, it's not kind of force, you don't have to do it, but it really is good to share. And um, people like to listen to what other people have got to say because that's how we all learn, you know? We learn from interacting with each other. So talking about suicide and mental health issues generally shouldn't be any different at all. So that's what we aim to do tonight, is get everyone talking. I just um, want to say a few words and then it's really over to you, because the whole object of this uh, initiative two years ago um, has been to, to broaden understanding communication, because we've been since then, the whole thing's got much bigger. So we don't go to lots of different places and just talk about suicide. We're talking about major forces in your lives. Uh, on the one hand, you can in a sense, combine it and put it under one envelope, namely stress. There isn't a single person in this room who doesn't have an element of stress in their lives. Uh, and don't believe that it's worse than it ever was, it isn't. The difference is, I was thinking, you, you probably gathered by listening carefully, but if you didn't listen carefully, I'll just fill the gap in. Um, I've been practicing since 1967. So this is uh, my 50th year celebrated actually last night by the person who sponsors this debating society. And in that time, the difference is that when I started huge stress, I came from a background where nobody had ever thought about the law. I went into establishments where people such as myself hadn't really been countenanced and into a whole professional life which was alien to me and a lot of other people. So there were stresses there, but the difference between then and now, whether you look at the bar, and we've, we've gone, uh, done this exactly for the bar, the barristers, we've done it for doctors, we've done it for other universities, we've done it for government departments, Bristol Prison, we've been all over the place just with a simple idea. Why is this taking off, I think, personally, it's only a, a view, and that is because the difference between 1947, 57 and now, I'm afraid, I haven't got one on me, <laughs> is, I call it the screen culture. The extent to which you and I are dependent on information and communication through a screen. Now, at one and the same time, it produces and, and manifests a conundrum. Conundrum being, you connect with the world, wonderful, but you don't actually do that you get increasingly isolated. And one of the things we've come across is the, and it's talked about there in a way, but the isolation that has been increased by increased global globalization to such an extent that the problems that we're talking about now are not just your age group, and, and I'm sure you can uh, exemplify this, but we're dealing with young people of the age of six and seven and eight who are self-harming. And they're self-harming not just because of the stresses of daily life, but because of the psychological pressures and stresses put on by their colleagues and contemporaries who take an opportunity for anonymous bullying, of the kind I'm sure you're all familiar with. A and there are quite a lot of, I'm afraid to say, I don't want to sound like Mary Whitehouse, but television programs, which actually employ the whole idea of humiliation. That's why they succeed. So we have to be alert to the extent to which this whole screen culture is cultivating something which is quite destructive. So this initiative is intended in a sense now to counterbalance that by saying, hey, come out, let's just have an evening in which, or more than an evening, as Ruby said, you know, 
we do eventually want to be able to say that there are places throughout the United Kingdom where people have taken it over and they do it themselves and um, certainly that seems to be an idea that's being adopted by major firms are suddenly realizing they haven't got anywhere in our building which covers you know millions of acres of ground they haven't got a single space in which to talk because space is electronic not physical so that's been left anyway that's enough from me but i'm just saying that's become a much bigger context than when we started which was obviously out of a particular death but we were here last week and i don't, i can't see for looking but um, there were some very interesting people who came along last week, some of whom wanted to talk themselves about their... Because it's about you talking to each other, not talking to us. Uh, you need to hear each other talk about it and realise, uh, as Ruby says, you look into somebody else's eyes and you see the same thing is there and you immediately feel, yeah. You don't necessarily get answers that way, but you get a human contact which provides reinforcement, reinsurance and inclusion. That's the thing that is sometimes missing. So I'm going to leave it because Yvette's wonderful at facilitating because if you're not going to talk, she'll take you outside and you'll come back in and then you'll talk. So <laughs> <Thank goodness. laughs> Oh God, he's naughty, he's naughty. Okay, so <laughs> before I throw it open to you guys, um, we're re really trying hard to develop our work with younger people. Um, because it seems to us from everything we're hearing that children from primary school age throughout their educational lives, you know, up to and including university, that problems either begin there or they certainly manifest themselves there. And so we've got to look at why that is happening because unless it's something we address now for younger people, it's going to carry on for decades and everybody's going to grow up with continuing mental health issues and we need to stop it. We need to stop it right now. So it's great to see you here tonight, so many wonderful young faces. So we want you to enlighten us, okay? We want you to share your stories, share your experiences, and teach us about what it's like to be a young person today, the stresses, all the factors within your lifestyles that, that can make it such a challenge for you. So I'm going to stand up. Does anyone want to start? Does anyone want to open the conversation? Otherwise, I'm just going to pick one of you. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, great. If you stand up, that's perfect. What's your name? Hi. Sure, great, thank you. Um, yeah, no, my name's TJ. Um, and um, I lost um, a very close friend of mine to suicide when I was about 18. Um, so I now work a lot in mental health campaigning, which is why I came along tonight. Um, I think there's a big difference, there's a few big differences that came out of that video that we need to talk about tonight, which is the differences that, I can't remember the name of the man who was speaking on the video, mentioned when he said uh, that his stepson died um, because mm. he was Stephen, ill. Yeah. Stephen, yeah. Stephen. Barrister, yeah. His stepson died because he was ill, but his wife died from the psychological repercussions of that. And I think that's a really, really big thing that we need to talk about in the context of young people because there's a huge difference between the everyday stresses of life that might cause gradual psychological strain that means that eventually someone wants to do something as serious as take their own lives mm. and the difference between then someone who has clinical depression or schizophrenia or whatever it is that mm. means that eventually they're so ill that that causes them to take their lives. And I think that's something that we don't understand in our society very well. Mm. Um, so one of the things that I do a lot of here is education about mental health. And like you said, um, young people, um, it's getting to a stage now where it could be six, seven, eight, the people are starting to suffer from various mental health problems. Um, and when I asked a question at a mental health debate here last year, about, um, which was about the mental health crisis in universities, I made the point that actually, as you say, the mental health crisis is, is in our primary schools, not in our as well as in our yeah. universities. So um, I sort of wanted to say two things. One, that that difference is important, the difference between mental stress and mental illness. And also the fact that the way that we learn about that difference is because we should be starting our education in, in young children, primary school children, not at university, because that's, that's too late. Um, so that's why I want to open the discussion tonight. Yeah, Thank you. that's great. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Take that off you. Thank you. Well said. Yeah, so it's not just us that think it, you know, 
people such as yourselves are agreeing that you know we've got we've got to capture children at a really young age to help you know stem this what is an epidemic you know we have a suicide epidemic we have a mental health epidemic in this country and it is getting worse and it is getting worse so what do we do how do we make people stronger how can we support each other and give them the emotional strength you know for people that are frail how can we do that anybody got any ideas on how we can support each other and gain some strength from each other any ideas this is a very quiet group. I would, I would sort of just leap in at not as a young person, you understand, but as somebody who has young people um, under my care. But um, I think one of the most important things from my experience is teaching children that failure is important and it's not a bad thing and it's a building block to you know to their lives and actually dealing with failure in a positive way so that they're not devastated and destroyed when they encounter it which we all do and perhaps we need to share that experience of failure a bit more yeah. with each other um i would see that as a positive contribution to helping young people actually navigate life less damaged yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. This lady here. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, I lost my voice. Um, so I'm actually doing research at the moment for my thesis about cyberbullying. So I liked ah. what you said about all that because I know it's in America and here very and Ireland as well very high suicide rates from cyberbullying and I think one of the things we could do with young kids because it's happening at um, primary school age and you know early teens is to maybe better educate schools and parents about how serious internet cyberbullying can be that cyberbullying can be because um, in a lot of studies and you know personal experience teachers don't like to report bullying because they don't take it seriously and teachers and parents don't didn't grow up with the internet and they don't understand how seriously kids take it because it's such an integral part of their lives and they are just like oh that's them on their internet time and they're not on social media most likely or they're not dealing with the same people in that age group and I think um, one of the biggest initiatives we should do is like to have like I don't know staff training and you know parent training just saying like hey no the internet is a very integral part of kids lives and it's it's something that shouldn't be taken lightly and also by you saying it's just the internet that makes them feel even more isolated and that makes them feel even more unheard because um, especially when it comes to like rumor like trying to dispel a rumor about oneself like no one's actually listening to them because you know the rumor is more powerful than the truth and um, I think that's what often gets people is the rumors and the harassment and then no one hearing them because it's such an invisible thing um, so I think that's another thing we could do for young kids yeah definitely thank you very much thanks for that Jump sorry. I'll put <laughs> that off you thank you so you wanted to say something I really also it's okay Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed what you guys were saying about um, the technological implications of being a teenager or a young person today. Yeah. And I personally feel like it's because a lot of what goes online is permanent. So once it's there, mm. you can't escape either your successes or your failures. Um, that's so that's kind of what I wanted to add. Um, and also if there are photographs of you that you don't like, they're online, people take them, yeah. they're there. Yeah. Um, it kind of creates a history of your life that you can't get away from. Uh, whereas I imagine for my parents, if they make a mistake, you know, their family can solve them, but it's not, there's no record of it if they don't want there to be a record of it. Um, so that's, that was my contribution to the thing. About, and to talk, okay, about a solution to that, I think creating a barrier between yourself and your social media profile is important. And if you are given an iPad at the age of seven, it might be quite hard to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of young people, that's just what happens now. Uh, it both is an educational tool and otherwise. Um, yeah, does anyone else have anything they want to add at this point? Anybody else got any thoughts on cyberbullying especially? Yeah, sorry, yes. I suppose it's about use of the internet. Um, I'm a mother of four 
teenagers. So I obviously grew up without the internet and all that. And I see how harmful it is um, for my own children and, and others. And it's, the question's around how do you pull it back? Because I really do think it's very, very harmful. But how do we stop it now that it's, it's happening? Yeah. Can, we, can we bring it back to how it used to be? I mean, most people, people in the room here are younger than me. And so what do you all think? Do you think we can bring it back to how it used to be? Or is that just wishful thinking? That's a good point, actually, and you're not the only person to say that. We attended a charity fundraising function um, a couple of weeks ago, and it was called Young Minds Matter, and it was primary school children through to uh, secondary school children. And they all played a really big part in, in this event. And one of the organisers was saying um, to me that we should do a stop the world, stop the cyber world, you know, for a day, for a week, whatever, and try and get people back to basics, get us back to being human, okay? Not the robots we've become at the mercy of all these electronic devices. Yes, sure, they have their uses. We're not saying they don't. But the fact is we've become reliant on it. And I don't actually really think we realise how reliant we are upon them and it's, and it's frightening. And to think that children in schools, you know, part of their education is on computers and, you know, so that they're on the screens all the time. So I think it would be great if there was a, a big call around the world, actually, not just in the UK, but around the world. So let's stop the world for a day. Let's get off and let's take things back to basics and let's communicate with each other face to face. Yeah. So if I want to ask you a question, I've actually got to make an effort yet to physically see you and ask you, not hiding away behind a screen where, you know, it's so easy to say things you don't mean or, you know, behave in a certain manner. So I think we really need to focus on that. And I think we need to get a lot of charities together maybe and, and have a real drive towards a day like that where literally the whole world gets off the cyber merry-go-round. I think it's the only way we can start to make inroads in that because it's a real problem, a big problem. Anybody else got any thoughts on cyber? Yes, thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, just to come in on that point about the internet's role in cyberbullying, I would say that I definitely agree with what you said, Yvette, about how face-to-face -face contact is one of the most important things when you're trying to express your feelings and trying to work out how to um, really connect with other people on a deep human level. And the internet can be a really terrible means through which children can become incredibly upset. There are these awful um, sites online, often connected with Facebook, sometimes not. Um, one that springs to mind that was really popular when I was about 14, 15, was one called Ask.fm. Um, and that was a site through which people could submit um, anonymous questions to you that you could answer. Um, but people, it, people would always abuse the site and um, ask mm. questions about something that was specifically designed to be hurtful. So of course that is very bad and should be avoided and children, especially underage children, should be protected from this. Um, but something that else that I'd just like to say about um, the internet is that it's not necessarily always a bad thing. It can, have, it can be really, really beneficial for people suffering mental health crises. So I'm a um, mental health officer at my college and I'm currently trying to set up a list of very, some very helpful apps that I've found and that either I've used or I know people who've used them that work to tackle um, not just some of them are designed to help you kind of plan your day out if you're suffering from a mental health issue and they boil things down into bite-sized chunks so you can cope with the reality of normal life when your brain is not functioning in the same way that most people's do so it allows you to take things at your own pace and then others focus on um, what is often deemed positive mental health so working to prevent mental health crises by encouraging you to take time out and reminding you of all the good stuff that goes on in your life and um, th so things pertaining to mindfulness and really thinking about how you can change your thinking about the way you live so yeah I, I just th I think that the internet is a really good tool and it really depends on how we use it but of course your point about face-to-face -face contact being something really special and ultimately very essentially human um, I do agree with and think that would be a terrible thing if we um, move too far away from it okay thank you thanks for that was there somebody else that wanted? Was there somebody else that wanted to say something on that point? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, this gentleman here. Okay. Sorry, sorry we'll come to you afterwards. Sorry. Uh, just on the point about face-to-face -face contact being really important and, and 
far better as a tool than the internet. Um, one of my closest friends from school, he seemed externally extremely happy, but unbeknownst to all of us in his group of friends, he had been self-harming for around eight months and attempted to take his own life twice. And face-to-face -face contact, so long as there's like an attitude of, of bottling things up, although people are keeping an eye on you and you can sort of interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis, so much can go undetected. Mm. And it's more, I think, about <coughs> sort of um, allowing the face-to-face -face time that you have to be beneficial and supportive rather than just like a, a, an unobservant tool that lets these things go undetected. Mm. Whether the internet has a role to play in, I don't know, increasing awareness about how exactly you can support people around you, how you can spot signs, yeah. I don't know, but mm. okay, thank you. things can go undetected. Thanks. Okay, um, gentlemen at the front, thank you. Yeah, you could wait for the microphone as well, that would be great. I'm in my 60s and I've had a very eventful life, but I use social media a lot because I have friends, family all over the world, mm. and I get upset, very upset at times, by stuff that I see. And something last week particularly upset me, and I thought I shouldn't be reacting like this. How on earth would a 16 year old cope with, with you mm. know, reading something very negative? Mm. Mm. Um, you know, it, it is a major, major problem, particularly for, for kids. If people like me can get upset, you know, what are the 16-year-olds? How are they coping with this? And somebody mentioned, you know, a day off, a day out. That should be a major sort of media campaign where everyone stops, get, get off for a day, yeah. and then talk about how the day went. And, you know, you, yes. you're going to obviously more uh, personal face-to-face -face interactions. Abs absolutely. Yeah, thanks for that. That's a good point because, you know, by by embedding ourselves in this uh, cyber world, this robotic world, you know, we, we do create isolation. You know, just, just because you've got a thousand friends on Facebook or however many followers on Twitter, you know, uh, that doesn't mean you're communicating effectively or for your own benefit with those people. You know, there's just people that want to see how your day's going, maybe some make, make some good comments, maybe make some bad comments. You know, you're watching it as if your very life depends on it. You know, what are these people saying about me? How do they, re do they react to what I post? I mean, it's utterly, think about it, it's utterly mad. If we'd have said 30 years ago, this is the, world, the, the way the world's going to be, we'd have actually laughed at each other. You know, it, it's just gone absolutely crazy. And for young people, you know, there's vulnerable primary school ages when, you know, their minds are developing, their personalities are developing, they're learning about the world, they're learning about people. And actually, for a lot of them, they're seeing such negative, horrible stuff. Are we surprised that people are growing up with such psychological issues? Because if we are surprised, we shouldn't be at all. You know, we're, we're sort of, we've created this. We want it this, we want it this fast, instantaneous world. You know, we've got it. But what's the price that we're paying? Because I think we're paying a really big price, and especially for our younger generations. I do. Okay, I'll shut up now. <laughs> Anything you want to say? Yeah, I listen very carefully on all these occasions because uh, there's a mix of thoughts going on because I'm obviously working in a highly stressed profession and we, we're going at the moment to help people uh, after the Grenfell Tower, Tower Fire, who've got nothing. So uh, we, we, there's a kaleidoscope spectrum of different situations. And one of the things that I'm trying to distill themes, and we're concentrating on the younger generation, and as far as I'm concerned, everybody's younger, so you know, I'm looking backwards in a sense, but also forwards to what we're trying to create here. And I think the other side of the, the bullying thing is, I think somebody else touched on it, is expectation. I, I accept what the gentleman said at the start, which we have to distinguish carefully between mental welfare and mental illness, which may be clinically discernible. However, in one sense, it is part of the same spectrum. And what I tend to do now is to talk about, well, well-being is a very common term now, but we, uh, mental welfare, and in the center of this is that you have a younger generation who are not only on their own screens, faced with a 
with expectations about what they should look like, what they should watch, how they should act, all governed by, in many cases, an external media which is feeding in all sorts of things all the time, as well as contemporaries doing the same. So you've got the expectation levels, and within just, you know, institutions like this, I've no doubt, and in, in the bar, I've no doubt, absolutely sure of that, and in many of the other places we've been, the emphasis is, is on a certain level of achievement, which in itself obviously is ex extremely good, but it, if, uh, as somebody said, learning to deal with failure and the fact that most of the time there will be failures. In fact, the people who've been super successful failed most of the time before they hit upon something that really worked. And it's learning the failure side of it, which no, nobody ever talks about it. They don't want to talk about it because you can't admit it. You've got to be, you know, the successful person. And it's creeping in to the six, seven and eight year old bracket, along with all the negative stuff. And, and we had, I just, end on this be, be, well, for myself anyway. I've never forgotten a meeting we had in uh, Coventry University and a woman came and she stood up. She started a group as a result. Her, her young daughter was cyber bullied and there is this, apparently this happens quite a lot, it's a bit like pyramid selling. You get a, a somebody hooked on a question. Answer this question and it will be anonymous or there might be a false name attached to it, it doesn't really matter. And it may be a question that could be of any kind about yourself, or it may be sexual about yourself, or it may be economic about yourself, at, even at this very young age. And when you, you have, the idea is to get the person to answer the question. And once they're answering the question, you're leading them into a cul-de-sac in which you nail them. Now you've told me all this about yourself, there's one in the papers only, uh, I think, two days ago. Uh, somebody was requiring photographs of all kinds of positions being sent, and, and somebody did it. People do it because it's so easy to press a button and start answering. And then, obviously, you have a blackmail situation, which is a very common one. Or you have the very extreme one where you're being encouraged to self-harm, and actually, you're a failure if you don't kill yourself. That's what the woman talked about. Her daughter was faced into killing herself. And then when it happened, they found out who had been putting the stuff on her, on her Facebook or whatever social media it was. When they found it, that same person was actually putting out more media messages afterwards saying she didn't kill herself well enough. There were better ways of doing it. Now, it seems to me when we got in a situation within a community in which there is, of course not everybody's doing it, but there, and that's the high or low level, whichever way you want to look at it. But we have to be aware of the repercussions of what we do. And I think the question of, I think you raised it, of closing it down for a, for a week and then finding out what's it been like? How have you managed to cope? And of course, the academics here, if there are any. Are there any academics in there? I mean, tutors, lecturers, professors? Are there any here? Well, it's interesting. You're half hard at holding your hand up. Um, I mean, I think... A very shy hand up. <laughs> you know, what, what interests me is, you know, would, would the institutions be prepared to do, oh, we're going to lose a lot of what? Money? Going to lose a lot of information? Yeah, maybe. Um, we're going to lose a reputation. You know, this is, this is weird. But, of course, what we're actually trying to do is encourage people to think outside the box and to be independent, which is what a university is about. Uh, of course, and, and, and I think that stems right back into the primary education. So I, I think it's a massive issue, and people are afraid. And, and, you know, you get on any bus, get on any tube, whatever, what's the first thing people do? Out comes the phone. Even people who are friends are talking to each other on the tube, on, the, on mobiles. And, you know, I'm going, well, uh, you know, I, f I personally feel I'm living on another planet here. Am I missing something? Well, I obviously am. But that's, that's how I'm looking at it, through these glasses. And I'm not particularly cynic. I'm very positive. I'm very positive about, that's why I said at the end of the film, about encouraging life. Uh, life means living life, not reacting to something. And of course I understand the internet's wonderful, it's got all sorts of information out there. However, using it is something that isn't really being, isn't really being taught. I, I went to a school where I've just remembered it, one of the main lessons was, what do you do with newspapers? That was the lesson. 
And we all thought, well, I've got a few ideas. But actually, what the, the person doing it, in fact, he, he, he was an English teacher, and he just said, do you read them? And if you do, do you believe them? And if you believe them, why do you believe them? And then he started to take apart the media. That, I mean, this is 50 years ago. So, I mean, then it was dominated by certain newspapers. And what he taught us to do was actually, he said, try living without them. <laughs> and so, you know, that's what happened. We tried living without them. Of course, that then led into living with them and using them in a particular way. And I thought that was very illustrative. And we're now at a crossroads where I think the same thing's got to happen. Sorry, uh, I'm on a bit of a hobby horse, but that's just a few thoughts. I'm interested in whether anybody else here has got, you know, thoughts about the, these issues or has been touched by, even by suicide, if you have, or personal stories or anything. Anything you want to say at all? It's interesting about what you said because basically it's, it's the multiple ways that our minds can be manipulated, you know, by other sources and actually that's quite frightening when you think about it. You know, you're reading this information, you're looking at it, you're listening to it and perhaps you don't actually realise it at the time but it is all mind, well, a lot of it is mind-bending stuff. Mm. I think, do you, want to, do you want to say something? Um, very quickly, we all know it's good to talk. Yeah. But what happens uh, with, with somebody who's very troubled, and you know they're troubled, mm. but they don't want to talk? Mm. Now, earlier in the year, I lost a colleague, and we all knew he was on a very self-destructive spiral. Okay. Was, it, was this to suicide? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, the coroner said it wasn't, but he'd left a note, and okay. we, we felt it was. Yeah. But we tried to approach this guy, and he got very, very aggressive. So how, you know, uh, if the professionals if he's not bad enough to be sectioned, how do ordinary people deal with a colleague or a friend who is obviously troubled but doesn't want to, you know, will not accept uh, help? Yeah. It's difficult. I mean, you know, because we're all human, none of us is perfect. And for some people, um, some people who are intent upon ending their lives for whatever reasons. Um, you know, there are some people, sadly, that I think, you know, you can't necessarily reach. But I think it's keeping a constant eye on them, being as supportive as you can, letting them know that you're listening and that you're hearing what they're saying and sort of just encourage them to discuss, you know, what they're feeling. Um, because wh what we hear from a lot of people that are considering taking their own lives is that although they're speaking to other people about it, they don't really feel that the other person wants to listen. They're not really hearing, you know, and they're just being polite. Um, and then as soon as that person's gone away, the conversation's forgotten. So people, again, feel that they're burdening other people. That's a really common feeling amongst them. They feel they're being a burden. And that's why they can be very reluctant to share information. So it's a case of persistence on our part, really, and showing that, you know, we're not just here, here with you for like five minutes to listen to you. you know, we're going to remember this and tomorrow we're going to come back to you and we're going to say, how are you feeling today? Are you okay? Do you need to talk again? You know, and that is really the best, you, as long as you know that you're doing the best that you can and you're genuinely supporting and genuinely listening, then, you know, the other person to a degree, I think you agree, has to, you know, they have to put something into it as well. You know, they need to be reciprocating and engaging with you, really. And I think, yeah, just on that, that um, I think the other important thing, which is what we try to do here as well, is not to be judgmental. In other words, many of them are frightened that what you're going to do is try to stop them. Well, that's actually not the object of the exercise. I've got promotion of life, yes, but there's a limit to which you can do that. And I think where somebody, obviously, the instance you give, somebody's quite well down the line and it may be, may be too late, it may not be. It's really providing an opportunity for them to think through for themselves what it is that actually captivating their lives, occupying their souls, and actually perhaps unfortunately forcing them into self-harm and the worst, obviously the fatal uh, final act. And, and I think once, once they realise that actually all, all you want to do is let them talk about it, and you're not going to jump down their throat, and the woman from Mind, uh, who's in the film, did, she didn't talk about it on the film, but um, I was interested in, because I never thought about it, you know, with my daughter. I had never thought about actually saying to somebody, well, you know, are you, are you feeling s s suicidal? 
you might not want to use that term. Do you, I mean, do you want to, you know, is it that bad that you want to end it all? So you'd use another phrase. And she said, that's fine. Ask the direct question. She said, you'd be surprised the answer you might get. Of course, some won't want to tell you the truth. But they'll be so amazed that you're asking them that question. Do you want to end it all? Are you serious? And, and she had a lot of follow-up questions, which now I will ask them, but before I wouldn't have. She said, right, if they say, yeah, they are thinking about it, you say, oh, well, what are you thinking of doing? And you wait. And sometimes they start talking about it. Well, I'm thinking of... And if they know you're not about to say, you can't do that, you can't do that, and they say, I'm going to stick my head in an oven or something, whatever they're going to say. The next question is, well, have you thought about how that is going to work? You start talking about things that are so practical, they begin to get, and, and have you thought that if you do that, you know, the family are going to come in and find, or if you're going to do it that way, how many pills do you have to take? I don't know, my daughter took pills, but, and coming back to the coroner, interesting, the law hasn't caught up. So what happens in coroner's courts where there's a, a suicide, where there's a suicide, I use that term. Coroners have been encouraged not to use the word. The BBC are encouraged not to use the word. Why? Because there's still some kind of um, taboo that's hanging about at the back of this. So coroners actually now tend to come back. They don't have verdicts anymore. They're called narratives. So they will give you a... They're trying to be human and kind, and I understand it, but actually, as you said, we all know that it was suicide. They leave a note often, but the coroner is saying, won't use that word, and sometimes they won't go as far as saying to it their own lives. They will say, died in the following circumstances, having taken and put a rope round or whatever it is. Terrible. Because they want to conserve your feelings. That's very touching, but actually, it's like facing the truth. The truth is, in my daughter's case, she wanted to end her life. There was no other way. And she left a note. The world, not the world, she meant, got two young sons. They'll be better off without me. She's got herself into that state. Now, if, she's al if she'd been allowed to, and I'm not saying anybody stopped her, but if any of us had actually appreciated what was going on and had just nudged, famous word that's being used a lot now, just nudged her into talking, and nudged her down the line. Now I know, you know, the approach you can take. And as she said in the film, that, I'm sorry, I've forgotten her name, from Mind, is that, you know, people will be relieved if you do ask them. I'm not saying this would have applied necessarily yours as an extreme case, but it's, I, I think we have to be, we have a responsibility, a collective responsibility to each other, in the street, in the college, wherever. If you see somebody, and Yvette did it the other day, if there's somebody distressed, they may not want anything. They may not want to be interfered with. On the other hand, they may want you just to reach out and be present for five seconds. And you did it at an airport as well, where somebody got herself in a terrible state. And they just need presence of people. You know, it's the reaching out. Sometimes it's the physical hug that does it. But... And I think that's the sort of reaction that we kind of lost. I think families have a responsibility, parents have a responsibility, schools, universities have a responsibility. It doesn't have to be an item on the curriculum. It has to be a cultural change and a cultural approach which feeds into everything we do and actually informs everything we do. I mean, has anybody listened to the radio anymore? Oh, two of you do. Good. Yeah, they're both in my generation. Um, <laughs> Pullman, he's on again tomorrow. He's, he's, have, you, have you heard him this morning? Yeah. yeah. And this is what he's talking about, essentially, the issues we've been talking about tonight, which have inspired his writing, and he's the final one in the series. Unfortunately, I've only seen, I've only heard this one today. But, um, so it, it, it infuses his work, and some of you have probably read Northern Lights and the other works that he's done, but it, amazing writer who, who is reaching out in exactly these ways uh, and is obviously equally concerned about the way we get shut off. I, I, I'm sorry, I'll shut up for a minute because I know you wanted to say something. We're, we're running out of time, so we'll take one or two more comments. If She's that's had okay. a hand up so for yeah. We'll take who else this wants is, uh, to speak. <coughs> two right. subjects I'm asked to speak about. One is uh, talking about millennials and what do I know because most of the people in this room are millennials, though two of my kids are. 
so I know very little about it. But <laughs> one of the things that comes up is, of course, the idea that the generation gap is how many screens you can have open at any one time. And I don't know how many people, a quick survey here, actually sleep with their mobiles. I've usually found, by the way, that actually it's about a third of most of the audiences I'm working with. And the average number of times that people check, tap, scroll is about 2,167 times a day. Oh, a young millennial friend told me that is really, really an understatement. Um, but I think at the same time as having said all that, I think, it's, I, I think this is only part of the story. I can think of two teenagers whose lives were saved because they were going to commit suicide and they put it on their Facebook site and they had a cool enough dad or mum in the two different cases to get there and prevent it. Now, I, I quite agree with you, isn't that crazy they didn't have the face-to-face -face analog conversation rather than the digital one. Um, but, you know, I don't think we should just parade that it's not just the media, it's actually a lack of people having methods to still their mind, to be at peace, to get rid of stress. And I, that's a lot of the work that I'm involved with. I don't want to publicize that now, but just say, I don't think it's just about making the technology the bad object. Mm. I couldn't agree more about newspapers. I travel a lot, I work overseas, and I tell you what, not reading British newspapers for a week <laughs> makes you feel so gloriously positive about life <laughs> and the future. It's a fantastic <laughs> cure. But I basically think that people need what Yvette was talking about, that um, complete holiday, you know, mm. t perhaps just in a period of meditation twice a day, getting rid of stress at some very fundamental, it doesn't get rid of it completely, but restoring the balance of the physiology yeah. is part of the story. Yeah. And what you're saying about talking, I, I found very insightful because my kids, I think of as super balanced. Maybe you did yours, Michael. Uh, I'll go and talk to them tonight. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for speaking. Thanks. You, does, is there one last person who wants to round up this evening who hasn't, hasn't spoken? <laughs> um, you've actually had your hand up, uh, the gentleman in the third row. I think from our discussion last week, what I learned was, firstly, that some people who you would never have imagined had been affected by these kinds of issues actually had been and so therefore I think people are not always aware of how widespread an issue it is and that can lead to them thinking that they are alone in this but actually they're not so that's why I think it's so valuable that people are aware that others are feeling the same way and also what I was really interested in was a girl who had lost a very good friend through suicide so that actually what she didn't want was people just to go and try and distract her from it or and distract her attention from that person but actually sometimes what she wanted most was to be asked about that person and to give to have that opportunity to talk about why they miss them so much yeah so that i think Absolutely. was very interesting to know and perhaps is something that we should bear in mind when talking to those who have been affected in this way and that's yeah. an honest thank you thank you for thank conclusions you. i'm afraid that really is all we have time for so would you all please join me in thanking michael mansfield and yvette greenway Thank you.